Tonight, an extraordinary insight into the life and nature of Leonid Brezhnev from a handful of American leaders who dealt with him at the summit. He wouldn't give up the principles representing his government on the one hand, but on the other, he could be very human and a pleasant person to chat with. Believe me, he was as tough and ruthless uh, and frankly able as anyone I've ever met. Pretty surprised all of us with his vigor and his competence and his ability to carry on a tough and c a comprehensive negotiations even above and beyond the prepared text. Also joining us tonight, former Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig to discuss Brezhnev's death and its impact on the United States. This is ABC News Nightline, an expanded edition. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. Just listen for a moment to the opening paragraph of a story about Leonid Brezhnev that ran in Monday's Washington Post. Four years ago, the story begins, Kremlinologists predicted his fall from power. Two years ago, they speculated about how long he could last. In recent months, he was written off as too ill to function. Yet today, Leonid Brezhnev remains the undisputed leader of the Soviet Union. That was Monday, just three days before Brezhnev died and four days before his death was announced early this morning. Tough, resilient, somewhat larger than life. Leonid Brezhnev, who would have been 76 next month, and to the very end, he was perceived as the most powerful man in the Soviet Union. We needed some help to explain this remarkable man, and so we approached the few Americans who ever dealt with Brezhnev as equal partners. He was warm. Uh, he was fun, uh, he was interesting, uh, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, as a communist, believe me, he was as tough and ruthless uh, and frankly able as anyone I've ever met. To me, he seemed quintessentially Russian. He was a bullion and insecure. Very conscious of his power and yet somehow convinced that nothing in the Soviet Union would ever work quite the way it was planned. A convinced communist. He could be tough on the one hand and was, but there was that other side of the coin. He was a very human individual in a different environment. And he could be both uh, changed from one to another rather rapidly. In other words, he was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I. Uh, would say he could be coarse and crude. Uh, I would say less subtle than persistent. He uh, he would stick to his his would stick to his cause, and he would do it in a humanly more attractive manner than some of the other Soviet leaders. He was not a madman. You could deal with him if you were firm. He could be a very very tough, very staunch. Uh, negotiator on behalf of the Soviet Union and he was well informed he strongly uh, advocated the views of his government but on the other side of the coin he could be a very human individual uh, after we'd had a very emotional uh, dinner at our small dining room there were only ten of us and I had proposed the toast to uh, future relations and hope that our grandchildren would live in a more peaceful world and could meet as we were meeting Russians and Americans like this. He arose from the table. He came around the table. Uh, I stood up. He grabbed me, gave me a bear hug. The tears were streaming down his cheeks uh, and he said, I just hope that uh, uh, this great goal can be achieved. I think the tragedy, the dilemma, whatever you want to call it, of Leonid Brezhnev was not that he was not sincere in his professions for peace but that he could not necessarily bring himself to pay the price that was necessary for a permanent peace. Later in this broadcast, we'll have more from our interviews with President Ford, Nixon, and Carter. We'll also hear from Henry Kissinger, and joining us live will be former Secretary of State Alexander Haig. But first, the latest from Moscow. Workmen were busy late into the night draping red and black bunting on Moscow's Trade Union Hall of Columns where Brezhnev's body will lie in state from Friday through Sunday. Brezhnev will be laid to rest in Red Square beside the Kremlin Wall. 
Soviet television interrupted one of the concerts it has been broadcasting since even before Brezhnev's death was officially announced to show hundreds of factory workers holding up pictures of the late Soviet leader. It was under Brezhnev's leadership that the Soviet Union achieved what it had always sought in the post-World War II period, parity with the United States. John Martin recalls Brezhnev's years in power and his life. Leonid Brezhnev was a child of the Russian Revolution, the direct successor of the men who overthrew the Tsar. He was not as brilliant as Lenin, perhaps, not as terrifying as Stalin, nor as shrewd as Khrushchev, but personally he was more persuasive and polished as a world leader. Richard Nixon first encountered Brezhnev as an eavesdropper in his famous kitchen debate with Khrushchev in 1959. Nixon later met Brezhnev at three summits, signed agreements with him, developed detente with him, and called him the best politician in the room. With Brezhnev, you had a man not as quick as Khrushchev uh, intellectually, uh, a man far better mannered, not as rash as Khrushchev, more cautious. Uh, one who consults with people before acting. And in that way, a much safer man to have sitting there with his finger on the button. A man safer but duller, according to those who knew him. A cautious, conservative chairman of the board of communism. The butt of jokes because, at first, he seemed so plodding. The cult of personality ended with Brezhnev, they used to say, because he had no personality. But they were wrong. Once in power, he became almost flamboyant. He wore tailored suits, he drove fast cars, he hunted game brought to his retreats. And he liked pretty women, fussing over Willy Brandt's wife, Ruth, telling her all Russia would lie at her feet if she came to Moscow, joking with Bettina Parker, a beautiful American trading executive who did go to Moscow and found him powerfully attractive. He's a very strong man, tremendous presence very confident very personal and a great sense of humor to many other americans he seemed threatening but he was not an especially menacing figure in western europe because he often found a way as he did on signing an agreement with gerald ford in helsinki to talk of peace i want uh, peace and tranquility to reign in europe I want all the nations of Europe to live at peace with each other. He talked a lot about peace, perhaps because he came from a place ravaged by war. The Ukraine, hit by civil war in 1905, the year before he was born. Another civil war, then two world wars. He was the son of a steel worker who studied metallurgy first, then land use and reclamation. He became a protege of Nikita Khrushchev. In the Second World War, he was a political officer, somebody who talked ideology and morale rather than tactics or strategy. After the war, he seemed to shoot ahead, first secretary in one region, then another, then in a province, then elected to the Supreme Soviet in 1952. When Stalin died in 1953, he slipped briefly to the defense ministry, but recovered with Khrushchev's help ultimately directing the first cultivation of vast areas in Central Asia and Siberia, helping produce a record wheat crop. Then, in 1960, at Khrushchev's request, he began visiting foreign countries, touring Europe and Asia and Africa as chairman of the Presidium. Did he betray Khrushchev and help ease him out in 1964? Perhaps. Whatever his role, he took over in what looked like a temporary shift. He shared control for a time, then finally took over completely, sitting for nearly 20 years at the pinnacle of Soviet power. He developed the Brezhnev Doctrine, no deviation from Soviet style and control. He sent troops to Czechoslovakia in 1968, to Afghanistan in 1980, clamped down in Poland too. He signed agreements with the West to increase trade, limit arms, ease tensions, and to respect human rights but he punished dissenters, banishing them to exile or prison. In the end, he presented the West with a perilous puzzle. He talked detente while arming the Soviet Union and Cuba on a massive scale. 
Was he acting in defense, as he said, or preparing for a military showdown with the West? I think that he had read and practices the doctrine of Lenin, which is probe with bayonets. If you encounter mush, proceed. If you encounter steel, withdraw. Leonid Brezhnev seemed a mixture of insecurity and boldness, saddened and angered by the American boycott of the 1980 Olympics, inflexibly keeping control in Eastern Europe and extending Soviet influence and power. At the end, he was an old man, crippled by disease and the weight of ruling for so long a country still struggling with modern comforts and simple freedoms, while it rose under his command to the rank of military superpower second to none. John Martin, ABC News, New York. When we return, we'll talk about Leonid Brezhnev with former Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Dear Republic, your agent, Mr. Lashbrook, saved me $234, making me a hero with McGuffey. That's service. Dear Republic, I've called reservations many times and always been treated with utmost courtesy and even a sense of humor. Nobody serves a Republic like Republic. You can open up your world and make it shine. You can do it. You can squeeze that extra something out of life. Yes, you can. You can set a goal and do it. Add your own style to it. It's your world. It's your life. It's your time. Every minute you can do it. Every day. Yes, you can. You can grow in your own way. You can do it. And we like to help. Visa. If you drive a foreign car, you've probably got squeaking brakes. And you've either been told you'll have to live with the problem or that it would be fixed and it wasn't. This is the problem, your disc brake pad. And this is the solution, Braco's new disc brake pad. When we install these brake pads on any foreign car, no more squeak. You don't have to live with squeaky brakes. Now they can be fixed at Bill King's Braco. Check the yellow pages for the location nearest you. King of the Commodores. There's a history of stroke and high blood pressure in my family. So it's important for me to control as many of the risk factors of heart and blood vessel disease as I can. Like the American Heart Association recommends, I get my blood pressure checked regularly. Call your American Heart Association and find out what you need to do to control your risk of heart disease. Hey, we're fighting for your life. Sunday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain. Easy, miss. I've got you. you. You've got me? Who's got you? Christopher Reeve is Superman. Joining us live now from New York is former Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Mr. Secretary, give us whatever insight you can to what goes on in the councils of our government at a time like this when a, when a Soviet leader dies. Well, Ted, I think uh, this is not an unanticipated event. And for some months now, uh, the administration's been very much aware of the impending likelihood of, of the death of uh, Mr. Brezhnev. And clearly, uh, assessments continue uh, day to day on what the ramifications of this event would be. You've known a number of the Soviet leaders. You knew Brezhnev. Uh, you, you met with him a number of times. Is there really any appreciable difference among them when they take power? Don't, they, don't the national imperatives kind of force a policy of their own? Well, there's no question that uh, responsibility brings its own imperatives. Uh, 
And that was the case, uh, I'm sure, with Mr. Brezhnev. I do think that perhaps uh, his own legacy, which looked so promising to all of us in the heyday of detente in the early 70s, was became victim to the interpretations by the Soviet Union and perhaps Mr. Brezhnev himself in the wake of Vietnam and Watergate that the West was vulnerable. We saw a number of incursions uh, starting with the uh, an unresponsive West in Angola, Ethiopia, southern Yemen, efforts against northern Yemen, two uh, incidents, uh, one which continues today in Afghanistan and Kampuchea. And I think the tragedy of his life was that uh, at the culmination of his reign, which was one of substantial accomplishment from the Soviet point of view, uh, all things went sour because the reach uh, went too far, especially with the Afghan and Polish situation. Was he sincere, do you believe, in, in his efforts toward detente? I mean, was that something he genuinely wanted, or was it, as some people have led us to believe more recently, simply something to throw America off guard? Well, I suppose there were some uh, criticisms to be cast at both ends. Uh, perhaps we in the West, and America especially, expected too much from detente. Uh, clearly, the imperative of Soviet policy is to continue to insist as a religious article of faith that uh, while they can uh, avoid some of the more blatant risk-taking, they still continue to enjoy the right to engage in so-called wars of liberation, uh, not only within the uh, so-called neutral spheres, but even within the spheres of uh, uh, traditional Western interests. I realize, Secretary Haig, that uh, there are probably still members of Brezhnev's generation, and we're going to be talking about some of them a little bit later, who may succeed him in kind of an interregnum here. What's going to happen when that next generation takes over? Well, that is an inevitability, of course, and I would look at it in the midterm, uh, maybe ten years from now, or perhaps five, depending on the final successor uh, in this phase. And we still don't know who that will be, whether it is on drop-off or one of the other front runners. But uh, I think it is vitally important now that uh, the West conduct itself with consistency, with reliability, uh, make it clear that when uh, moderation is the character of Soviet diplomacy, that there will be a response on the part of the West. I know President Reagan today expressed his own desire to improve our relationships with the Soviet Union, and I'm confident that that remains his objective. Just give us, if you would, in, in closing, a thumbnail sketch, your own, of Leonid Brezhnev. Well, I uh, would call him a very earthy and very Russian individual. Uh, physical, good-humored, uh, extremely... Uh, Bolshevik in character, and that is a product of a system in which uh, only the ruthless uh, survive, and certainly only the ruthless reign. Uh, on the other hand, I think he viewed himself subjectively as a man of peace, uh, and was extremely conscious of the 20 million casualties uh, of his uh, fellow uh, Russians uh, during the Second Great War, and somewhat dedicated to the need to prevent uh, a holocaust of that kind. Secretary Haig, thanks very much for joining us. When we return, an interview with former President Nixon about his personal dealings with Leonid Brezhnev. A lot of business systems promise to save you money managing your lighting. Just follow the phone lines. <laughs> and save you money controlling your air conditioning. Follow the phone lines. And even save you money on your heating. We're following the phone lines. But consider energy management from Bell. And this system operates right on your existing telephone line. It's part of a dimension system. So it not only saves up to 20% a year on energy, it saves on installation too. The knowledge business.
set yourself free. Stovers. First blood. You don't seem to want to accept the fact that you're dealing with an expert in guerrilla warfare. Are you telling me that 200 men against your boy is a no-win situation for us? You send that many, don't forget one thing. A good supply of body bags. Sylvester Stallone. This time he's fighting for his life. First Blood. Rated R. Now playing at theaters near you. Meet Angie. She's from the Humane Shelter. And thanks to the Earth Foundation, Angie has a chance to lead a useful life. Through training like this dog received, she'll open up the silent world of a deaf person to doorbells, telephones, alarm clocks, prowlers, smoke detectors, or even a baby's cry. And the deaf person's life, although still silent, will no longer be lonely. Share your gift of hearing by helping to finance hearing dog training. For information, contact the Ear Foundation. Sports 20 great years, and here's another reason why. Determination. The drive of highly ranked Penn State. Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions, led by quarterback Tom Blackledge and top rusher Kurt Warner, are aiming for the top. But Jerry Faust and his fighting Irish are determined to stop them. Can Notre Dame's gold rush defense, one of the best in the nation, tame the Lions' awesome attack? Don't pass up this key showdown. Plus other games. A great reason to watch NCAA college football Saturday on ABC. Monday. I want tonight to last forever. I am desire, if you desire me. You can't have me! It's forever, I desire. Due to tonight's expanded edition of Nightline, the last word will not be seen tonight. The last word returns tomorrow. Among our former presidents, Richard Nixon was involved in the longest and perhaps the most fruitful negotiations with Soviet President Brezhnev. When I talked to President Nixon earlier today in New York, I began on a different note, however, recalling an incident involving Hollywood actor Chuck Connors, who years ago starred in the television series The Rifleman. Mr. President, you know the scene that, that stands out in my memory was in, in San Clemente, when Leonid Brezhnev picked up Chuck Connors, all, what was he, about six foot six, I guess, and just picked him up in that great big bear hug and lifted him off the ground. He was himself kind of a bear of a man physically. How did you find him emotionally, intellectually? Well, both uh, emotionally and intellectually, he was also a bear of a man. Uh, he was a very physical man, and it's and he's like Lyndon Johnson that way. He, when he wanted to make a point, he would, he would grab you by the arm. I don't know, as I'd say, he was an arm twister, uh, but he gave a pretty good imitation of it. Did you like him? As a person, as a Russian, yes. He was warm, uh, he was fun, uh, he was interesting, uh, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, as a communist, believe me, he was as tough and ruthless uh, and, frankly, able as anyone I've ever met. How did, you, uh, how did you prep yourself for a meeting with a man like Leonid Brezhnev? I mean, obviously, you bring in all your experts, you have them tell you yeah. everything that they know about the man. How did, how did that briefing differ from the reality the first time you met him? Well, I went through this twice. I went through it first back in 1959 when I visited Khrushchev. And I talked to a number of people then, and I read reams of briefing books and still could not really be prepared for the unpredictability of Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, the same was true of Brezhnev, but not to the same extent. Uh, Brezhnev was more predictable. Uh, I found the best way to do it was to read as much as I could, and not just what was prepared by the State Department professionals, which was excellent, but by people who knew him in the media, by uh, people who, in the diplomatic corps, who, uh, I, I, for example, talked to uh, uh, people from uh, Ceausescu of Romania, and. Uh, people of that sort who knew him, and that gave me a, ver a great deal of uh, information that I needed. How did they sum him up to you, and, and, and again, how did that differ from what you found? Well, <clears throat> I would say they summed him up as first being the man in charge. Uh, you know, there was a, a feeling at a, for a while that it was kind of a collective leadership. You may recall it, it was Brezhnev and Kosygin and Podgorny. Uh, but those that I talked to, particularly the British, uh, told me there was no question that Brezhnev was the man, uh, that he was in charge. Uh, he consulted the others, but he made the decisions. 
he would sometimes bow to the others, and he would sometimes bring them into the conversations, but make no mistake about it, he was running the show. And I would say that when I met him, I found that was the case, but I also found that as distinguished from Khrushchev, he used his colleagues more. I'll never forget a night in, in Summit 1, uh, out at the Dasha, uh, where before we were supposed to have dinner at 8 o'clock, he took, us into a, took me and Henry Kissinger into a, a, a room, and for three hours, he, with Podgorny and Kosygin, uh, each sort of uh, coming in uh, after the other got exhausted, uh, pounded me on Vietnam. Uh, I didn't think they would ever get through. After it was over, we went upstairs and had a very cordial, friendly meeting, tipping glasses and all the rest. In other words, he was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Does it do any good to worry about Soviet leaders? Are we really dealing with one man who is in charge ever? Or, or is, it, uh, is it so much a collective leadership at the best of times that you're only dealing with a front man? Uh, it is a collective leadership, true. Uh, but the front man in the Soviet Union really makes the big decisions. He runs the show. There's no question that Brezhnev made the big decisions. Uh, and I would say further, let me, let me get at your, uh, the question in a different way. Uh, in that system, uh, the names may change, but the plays remain pretty much the same. Uh, the people that succeed to Brezhnev, some will be younger. Uh, uh, some will have different personalities. Uh, but all will be dedicated communists. They will be dedicated to the proposition that the Soviet Union should extend its power of domination in the world. And they will be willing to take some chances in order to accomplish that goal. In this respect, the leaders will change, but the game will remain the same. Publicly, Mr. President, as I suggested at the beginning of our conversation, when, when Brezhnev came over here, he played even a little bit of the buffoon. But we always had to remind ourselves, those of us who were watching him from the outside, that this was the same fellow who was responsible for uh, Czechoslovakia, the same man who was responsible for Afghanistan and Poland, where was the brutal side of Leonid Brezhnev? Did you ever see that side? Well, I saw it in conversations at times. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, my, our conversation in the Dasha about Vietnam. Believe me, it was brutal. Uh, he thought we were totally wrong. Uh, he threatened that if uh, uh, we uh, did too much for the South Vietnamese, that they could not stand by and have their ally uh, continue to be embarrassed, as you may recall. We went to Summit 1 after having bombed and mined Haiphong, and they bitterly resented that because they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, also, I saw the brutal side in San Clemente. You mentioned that. Uh, after we'd had a very emotional uh, dinner at our small dining room, there were only 10 of us, and I had proposed the toast to uh, future relations and hoped that our grandchildren would live in a more peaceful world and could meet as we were meeting Russians and Americans like this, he arose from the table. He came around the table. Uh, I stood up. He grabbed me, gave me a bear hug. The tears were streaming down his cheeks, uh, and he said, I just hope that uh, uh, this great goal can be achieved. Two hours later, uh, he woke me up, or he had me woke up. Uh, we went upstairs in our small library, and he sat there uh, along with his ambassador and Gromyko, and for two and a half hours, going past midnight, he kept pounding me on the Middle East, threatening that if we didn't do something to restrain the Israelis, that war would come. Uh, and, of course, that they would be supporting them. And, of course, he happened to keep that promise, even though I made it very clear to him that we would not stand by and allow Israel to go down the tube. Mr. President, you know, we all play, for us in, in journalism, it's a very easy game to play, this game of speculation for the people who actually have to make U.S. policy it's a very risky game, but the game of what comes next, who comes next, what kind of policy, what do you think? Well, Ted, based on past experience, the leadership first will be collective. Uh, that was true after Stalin, as you remember. Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Khrushchev and then uh, uh, Malenkov. And after Khrushchev, uh, you first then had Brezhnev and Kosygin and Podgorny. And then uh, Brezhnev emerged as the leader. However, in this case, where Brezhnev's death has been anticipated, it may be uh, that the Politburo has already worked out the succession. My own guess is that it's very possible they may have a collective leadership, but for a very brief time, 
and that sooner than before, one man will evolve as a leader. Now the question is, who will it be? Uh, some think Andropov. Ceausescu, for example, of Romania, thinks no, because he said Andropov, as head of the KGB, made too many enemies. Uh, on the other hand, some uh, think it will be that. Uh, Kadar, for example, of Hungary, uh, where Andropov served as ambassador, thinks he definitely uh, will be the next uh, leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, I am not prepared to guess, except I would say this. Don't assume that with Brezhnev off the stage uh, that we're going to have an easier time. I know I've heard my friends say, oh, that terrible Brezhnev, the man that did what he did, you know, in Czechoslovakia uh, and, of course, in uh, Afghanistan and Poland and so forth, that when he goes, uh, then we're going to have an easier time. Uh, Brezhnev had a stake in detente. He was not a madman. You could deal with him if you were firm. Uh, we are not sure that the next man will have that same stake. I think he could have, but I think this is a time that could be uh, potentially very difficult for our side. President Nixon, thank you very much indeed. When we return, a conversation about Brezhnev we had earlier today with another former president, Gerald Ford. Something's coming. Something as mysterious as midnight. Cool as ice. It's new licorice ice, mint with a surprising hint of licorice, only from Bellamins. Great taste that only happens here. Bellamins, great taste that's always cool and clear. Cool refreshment, that's the Bellamins taste. Great taste that only happens here. Bellamins. Try new licorice ice. I don't have someone answering my phone calls for me. And I'm not a vice president in this company yet. But I do have money. M-O-N-Y. Financial specialists who gave me the advice and investments I need. Like a money market fund and an IRA. Because in my position, my money has to work even harder than I do. You don't have to be rich to have money. Our Whirlpool dishwasher has something no other dishwasher has. It has the clean, smart styling of a tilt-out control panel and the ease of solid-state touch controls. You can even set it to start washing hours after you turn it on. And this dishwasher also comes with a promise. A promise that will stand behind it with pride. Because we design our dishwashers the way we design our washers and refrigerators. To make your world a little easier. I want a social security retirement application for my uncle. I don't want him to miss his first check. You know, you could have called. I could have called? I should have called. Most social security business can be handled by phone. Call before you visit. I want you to snap out of it here. During the Great American Smokeout on November 18th, when the American Cancer Society asked all cigarette smokers to quit just for 24 hours, to help you quit, They'll give you a Larry Hagman special stop smoking wrist snapping red rubber band. Every time you feel like smoking, snap this instead. Enough snaps and you want to quit. So ask for a Larry Hagman special stop smoking wrist snapping red rubber band. If you can't say it, don't worry about it. Nobody's perfect. Well, almost nobody. Former President Gerald Ford was attending a conference at the Ford Presidential Library in Ann Arbor today when we talked to him about the death of Leonid Brezhnev. Mr. President, in a sense, this is sort of an electronic wake in which we, I guess, exchange reminiscences about the departed. And I'm wondering, what about Leonid Brezhnev stands out most in your mind? Tell me what kind of a man he was and how different he was when you first met him from whatever preconceptions you had. Ted, I had the opportunity of meeting uh, President Brezhnev on two occasions, once in Vladivostok, where for two days we negotiated a follow-on agreement uh, to SALT I, and secondly, in Helsinki in 1975, when we tried to uh, move forward to a final SALT II agreement. So I have uh, some fairly personal memories of meeting him way out there in 
uh, the Soviet Union in Vladivostok, and again, of course, in Helsinki. The uh, negotiations in Vladivostok took place in November of 1974. It was an attempt to refine the areas of agreement on a SALT II uh, agreement that would uh, lead to a reduction in uh, nuclear weapons by both the Soviet Union and ourselves. Uh, when I arrived in uh, Vladivostok or at an air base near, uh, I had been given in Alaska where we stopped before arriving a beautiful uh, uh, fur coat by an American. And when I got off the uh, plane in Vladivostok, Mr. Brezhnev just eyed that uh, beautiful coat. Uh, and uh, when I left after we had completed two days of rather hard negotiations, uh, I thought it would be a good gesture on my part to uh, make available to him. And I took it off my back and actually gave it to him. And his eyes lighted up and his face broke into a smile. And it was a nice, warm reaction that developed that I had hoped would be helpful in our subsequent negotiations trying to achieve a SALT II agreement. You know, Mr. President, in so many ways, Leonid Brezhnev became the, the personification to many Americans of that adversary, the Soviet Union. And yet, from everything I've read from people who have met personally with him, they found him to be, when he wanted to be, very warm, very charming. How was he to you? Uh, he was sort of a, a double or dual personality. He could be a very, very tough, very staunch uh, negotiator on behalf of the Soviet Union. And he was well informed. He strongly uh, advocated the views of his government. But on the other side of the coin, he could be a very human individual. For example, uh, the second day of our negotiations in Vladivostok, he walked into the room and sat down across the table from me and he had a package that was probably 10 inches high and four or five inches square. And he uh, said to me, uh, Mr. President, uh, here's a new missile I want you to see. We didn't know what it was, of course, and he opened it very carefully. And what it turned out to be was a beautiful pipe rack with three hand-carved Russian pipes. And he knew, of course, I was a pipe smoker. And he got a big kick out of that. And it sort of uh, eased the uh, harsh negotiations we'd had in the several uh, meetings previously. That period in Vladivostok that you were talking about, in a sense, was almost the high point of, of detente. Is that a period that will ever come back again, do you think? And what do you foresee during this, during this changing period now as the Soviet leadership shakes itself out? Well, the Vladivostok era was, I think, a good one from the point of view of U.S.-Soviet relations. It was constructive because the United States and the Soviet Union were both seeking to achieve a reduction in nuclear weapons which hopefully would reduce the danger of a nuclear holocaust. But on the other hand, in the interim, we in the United States were making an effort to try and keep our military capabilities strong enough so we could negotiate in a, an effective way. It was a two-pronged approach, namely a dialogue with an adversary on the one hand, but a deliberate attempt on our part during the process of negotiation or discussions to keep our country strong. That is the approach that I think uh, we in the United States had, and it was good, and I hope and trust will be the thrust of... Uh, the administration in Washington uh, in the future. Should we miss Brezhnev? Is, is, is his passing something that someday even Americans are going to mourn? I happen to believe that if he had lived, he would have been interested in the achievement of a U.S.-Soviet 
salt to or start agreement. That would have been a great achievement for him in Russian history. So we will miss him on the assumption that his successor won't be as uh, able to negotiate as he did. I think if Brezhnev had lived, we could have achieved a SALT to or a START agreement. It may take more time, obviously now, than it might have, and as a consequence from that limited point of view, uh, we could and will miss Mr. Brezhnev. President Ford, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ted. Henry Kissinger, who served as Secretary of State under Presidents Ford and Nixon, met with President Brezhnev many times. Earlier today, when we talked to Mr. Kissinger via satellite to Munich, West Germany, he recalled one of those meetings when Brezhnev invited Henry Kissinger to go hunting. Kissinger, who doesn't hunt, noted that he was there as an advisor rather than a participant. Uh, we were sitting in the woods of Savidovo, which is a game uh, reserve for the polit members of the Politburo north of uh, Moscow in a stand uh, while the dusk was falling. And somebody brought cold cuts and dark bread. And he began to speak about two seemingly contradictory subjects. First, about the menace represented by the Chinese and about the fact that the Soviet Union could not accept indefinitely a nuclear threat from the Chinese and implied that the Soviet Union in time would do something about that. And then he began to speak about his desire for peace and described his experiences in World War II, his separation from his family, the aspirations of his father in the Ukraine for permanent peace at the end of World War I, and where in the first part of the conversation he had been rather pugnacious, in the second part of the conversation, he struck me as an old man who had been somewhat exhausted by the struggles of a lifetime. And I always thought that both sides of Brezhnev illustrated the dilemmas of Soviet leadership and the ambivalences of, uh, of Soviet policy. You know, it's, it's interesting that a number of American leaders who have met with Leonid Brezhnev come away with that, uh, with that sense of a man who was earnestly, sometimes even passionately, in search of peace. It makes you wonder to what degree that was theatrical. He certainly wanted some measure of tranquility, but he also was the leader under which uh, Soviet military power was built up more than at any other period that suppressed the freedom of Czechoslovakia and Poland, that invaded Afghanistan, that uh, sent Cuban troops to Angola and Ethiopia. So it is, a, it is a very mixed story. I believe he wanted peace. I also believe that he did not forego opportunities that came his way, and the West was never united enough and never decisive enough to prevent opportunities from coming his way. And on top of it, we were divided about what we meant by relaxation of tensions or detente. So there were many factors that uh, that made it, that enabled him not to have to make the choice. To what degree, Dr. Kissinger, was Leonid Brezhnev the architect of Soviet foreign policy and domestic policy? To what degree was he simply the front man? Well, I think that towards the end of his life, he was more a front man than an architect. Nevertheless, I believe that the main directions of Soviet policy at least until 1977-1978, were importantly influenced by the personality uh, and the convictions of Leonid Brezhnev, and I believe that there will be changes in tone and in emphasis whoever emerges as his successor. Dr. Kissinger, in the final seconds that are available to us, sketch, if you would, a... a profile of Leonid Brezhnev, if you had 30, 40 seconds just to do that, how would you describe the man? He was a man who finally uh, was defeated, uh, or at least failed to achieve his aspirations because he couldn't overcome his ambivalences. But I must say he was an attractive man, though 
an ideological adversary, and an interesting man, though devoted to the expansion of Soviet power. And so, and he was a serious adversary who was trying to learn the grammar of partnership, but didn't quite make it for a variety of reasons. Dr. Kissinger, thank you very much indeed. When we return, a conversation about Brezhnev with former President Jimmy Carter. Every morning, I use Listerine antiseptic for me. In the morning, your mouth has millions more bad breath germs than the night before. Listerine kills the germs that can cause morning breath, and it works for hours. At night, I use it a second time for Lori. Listerine's strong. It keeps my breath clean a good long time. Listerine, one time for me. A second time for me. Listerine, twice a day. One time for me. A second time for me. It sneaks up on you, grabs you, shakes you. <laughs> the uncontrolled cough. But today there's Benelin to quiet coughs quickly, effectively, without a prescription. Doctors have introduced Benelin to families for over 30 years and recommend it in the same full strength more than any other cough suppressant you can buy. The strength of Benelin, available without prescription from Park Davis. If your confidence took a beating last winter, Now save $20 on the powerful Sears 50 battery. It's only $39.99 with trade-in. And save 25%, the largest savings ever on road handler all-season steel belted radials. Sears Best with a limited warranty for 50,000 miles. At Sears Tire and Auto Centers, we give you more than a good deal. We install confidence. You can count on Sears. Monday on That's Incredible, the woman who survived the parachute that never opened. A real-life Batman that wants to help you. And the wildest pool game ever, Ben. Don't be afraid. I am desire. I want tonight to last forever. And when you desire me... You can't have me! You pay for eternity. I'm a righteous man! I desire. Sunday. On Ripley's Believe It or Not, a Marilyn Monroe fantasy robot and the city that fought a volcano and won. Then, at 8, 7 Central and Mountain, it's the man of steel in action. Easy, miss. I've got you. you. You've got me? Who's got you? Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, Margot Kidder, and Christopher Reeve as Superman. We've already talked with two former presidents, Nixon and Ford, about what they remember of Leonid Brezhnev. Jimmy Carter was the last former U.S. president to negotiate with Brezhnev directly. We talked to Mr. Carter earlier tonight at his home in Plains, Georgia. Mr. President, Jimmy Carter was always known as a meticulous planner, so I have to assume that you went through voluminous briefing books on Leonid Brezhnev before you met him. Tell me a little how your own perceptions of him differed from what the experts gave you. I was briefed very thoroughly during the last few months leading up to the uh, Vienna summit on SALT II in June of 1979. Not only our own intelligence surveys and reports from our diplomatic forces in the Soviet Union, but I had long talks with uh, both uh, President Giscard d'Estaing from France and Chancellor Helmut Schmidt in Germany, who had just recently met with uh, President Brezhnev. They both reported to me that he was quite feeble, that there was some doubt that he had full control of the Soviet delegation and that he seemed to wander in his thought, thoughts concerning uh, intimate uh, and detailed uh, discussions. So when I arrived in Vienna, I was expecting uh, something much less than what I found. He was quite cautious as he walked along. He seemed to have trouble in keeping his balance on occasion, or was very cautious about not falling. He was hard of hearing. And when he would begin uh, conversations with me, both early in the morning during the long discussions and in private uh, conversations, his lower jaw seemed to uh, not move just exactly the way he wanted it. But uh, after he um, got involved in the conversation, he became animated. His speech uh, defect seemed to uh, go away completely. Uh, he was vigorous, uh, strong-willed, uh, had a heavy-handed uh, sense of humor, 
was obviously in full control of the Soviet delegation and uh, really surprised all of us with his vigor and his competence and his ability to carry on uh, tough and c comprehensive negotiations even above and beyond the prepared text that he always read at the beginning. You refer to his humor as, as yes. heavy-handed. Uh, can you um, give me an example? On one occasion, he said that uh, I was sitting on, on my side of the table with uh, Secretary of State Vance and Secretary of Defense uh, Harold Brown, uh, Security Advisor Brzezinski and others, and Brezhnev was saying, he's reading his text, and he said, it's obvious that all of us in this room want peace except that man. And he pointed to... Uh, Secretary Vance, who I think was the, was the most dovish person in the whole room, everyone <laughs> laughed except uh, Cy Vance, who was quite discomfited. But uh, Brezhnev laughed uh, very loudly and seemed to think that that was a striking sense of humor. You write in your, in your memoirs, Mr. President, uh, about that, that physical problem that he was having, the balance business, and how you steadied him many of the times when you walked together. And you also write that you felt that brought you a little bit closer together. Yes, I thought that was uh, interesting because uh, he didn't seem to try to conceal the fact that he didn't want to walk alone down steps, uh, even with full uh, television and uh, photographer coverage. He would put his uh, hand out without any restraint or hesitation on my arm or on my shoulder, and I would walk slowly uh, step by step with him down the uh, stairs or steps to make sure he didn't uh, fall. Uh, quite often, uh, when I was with him alone, uh, with just an interpreter present, uh, he would uh, place his hand on my shoulder or something and, and, and speak in, in very human and warm tones. Uh, he was kind of grandfatherly in his uh, aspect. Uh, he, he referred frequently to the horrible devastation of the Soviet Union during the war when the Soviets and we fought as allies against uh, Nazi Germany and reminded me again and again that uh, no other nation had ever suffered the 20 million casualties that the Soviet Union suffered in that war. He never wanted it to come back to his uh, people. One of the most interesting uh, events that I, that I wrote about was, was that when I had my first really private conversation with him after quite a lengthy period, uh, he, he got close to me, put his hand on my shoulder again and said, and said, Mr. President, the, uh, that God will never forgive us if we do not uh, succeed. Uh, t they're speaking of the nuclear arms control agreement on which we were working. I thought that reference to God from an atheistic uh, leader was quite significant. You know what I find fascinating, Mr. President? I told you I've, I've spoken earlier today with uh, President Ford and President Nixon in, in both instances, and now you have referred to it again. There is this reference by Brezhnev to this cannot, we cannot fail notion with, with particular reference to uh, the nuclear balance between the two countries and not going to war. How much of that do you think was theatrical on his part and how much do you think was really heartfelt? I don't think it was theatrical. I, I'm a fairly good judge of people. Uh, there was no reason for him to be theatrical of faults in his direct conversations with me then. They had no official significance. And I was, and I'm also judging that, on, not just on his words, but the fact that in my judgment, uh, throughout the long, detailed negotiations on SALT II, the Soviets negotiated in good faith. Uh, these talks were initiated under President Nixon, they were continued under President Ford at Vladivostok, and they were concluded by us. And, uh, and I was very happy to see the SALT II Treaty uh, pass, and it, as you know, its terms are now being observed by both sides of basic terms. Uh, I don't think there was any doubt that he wanted to control uh, nuclear weaponry, but when I tried to go beyond the SALT II Treaty uh, and take some bold initiatives uh, that hadn't been discussed among the committee or conference uh, around the Politburo or the General Conference of the, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, he was quite reluctant to, to make initiatives like that. I, I proposed, for instance, that we have an immediate freeze on the development and deployment of all nuclear weapons beginning that day. He refused. I also uh, offered him an immediate uh, opportunity for a comprehensive test ban to stop testing all nuclear explosives, both uh, peaceful in nature and warlike, and he refused. But in, his, in my private conversations with him, he thought these were excellent ideas that ought to be pursued, but, but he was not prepared to take an initiative on, him, on himself without it being first discussed within that enormous bureaucracy which does comprise the communist leadership in the Soviet Union. Let me, let me close on that note, Mr. President, by asking you whether you think his death will really mean anything in terms of the U.S.-Soviet relationship. Does the death of one man in either country really affect I policy? I don't think so. Uh, we have 
divergent points of view. Uh, we have some things in common. My own philosophy as president was to cooperate with the Soviet Union whenever possible, but uh, to compete with them uh, peacefully and effectively whenever it was necessary. And I hope that now, with his death and with the oncoming of the new leadership in the Soviet Union, that we won't do anything to disturb that relationship. We need to be uh, cautious, as they are, and we need to probe in every possible way to cooperate when we can to remove the threat of nuclear confrontation and to seek those areas of accommodation that are beneficial to both of us. There are some world leaders, like Anwar Sadat, for example, whom I know you miss. Will you miss Leonid Brezhnev? Not in a very personal way, although uh, I've sent a letter of condolence to his widow, and uh, I think he was a stabilizing force in the Soviet Union. My real belief is that from the bottom of his heart, he wanted to avoid any kind of war or conflict that would directly affect the Soviet people. This was a stabilizing factor, and I hope that his successors will have the same inclination. President Carter, thank, thank you very much. When we come back, we'll turn to the question of Leonid Brezhnev's successor in the Kremlin, reaction from President Reagan, and a report from Carl Bernstein on U.S. plans for the period of uncertainty in U.S.-Soviet relations, a period that has just begun. Keep America beautiful. Wear underalls. Take an ordinary chicken, same as the rest. Follow our directions and make it the best with the golden touch of Lipton. It's new golden mushroom soup mix. Right for your pork chops, chicken, and fish. The golden touch of Lipton. You get delicate seasonings and mushroom pieces. You add the water, the carrots, and peas to get something new that's sure to please. The golden touch of Lipton. So jazz up your chicken, your chops, or your fish. It's the newest way to go for a tasty dish. The golden touch of Lipton. New golden mushroom or golden onion. Parents, wouldn't you like a smarter kid than my mother had? Of course you would. Give your three to eight-year-old something my brother never had. A head start on learning with TLC, the Teach and Learn computer system, with 78 talking programs available. What color is the dragon? Very good. Mattel promises a smarter kid in 60 days, Tom, or your money back if you're not satisfied. With TLC, this need never happen again. A smarter kid in 60 days, or your money back from Mattel. Edge gel. Nothing shaves closer. Watch this demonstration versus foam using an ordinary credit card. First, I'll shave the left side with foam, the right side with edge. It's the gel that lubricates as it lathers to give you a really close shave. Now listen to the foam side. Then listen to the edge side. See why most men agree. Edge gel lets you shave closer than foam, and nothing shaves closer than edge. The Soviet news agency TASS has announced that the committee which will organize Brezhnev's funeral on Monday will be headed by Yuri Andropov, a 68-year-old member of the ruling Politburo who stepped down earlier this year as head of the KGB, the Soviet secret police. That announcement strengthens speculation that Andropov is the front-runner to replace Brezhnev. Other possibilities mentioned are Konstantin Chernyenko, age 70, a close friend and ally of Brezhnev, who is said to have run day-to-day -day party business when Brezhnev was ill. Viktor Krishin, boss of the Moscow Party Organization, age 67. Andrei Kirilenko, the most senior member of the Politburo, although he may be ruled out by his age, 75, and his ill health. And Mikhail Gorbachev, who at 50 is the youngest Politburo member. Those are the names being mentioned, but Soviet history has shown that betting on who is going to succeed to power in the Kremlin is a very good way to lose money. Barry Serafin reports. Since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Soviet Union has had only four major political leaders, a period in which the United States, by contrast, has had 13 presidents. And during the past 65 years, predictions about who would gain power have usually been wrong. Even the wishes of incumbents concerning their successors have been frustrated. Before Lenin died in 1924, he urged that Joseph Stalin be removed from top Communist Party ranks. But Stalin's hold on key party positions was too strong. So he, rather than his rival, Leon Trotsky, took control. 
Stalin was said to have favored Georgi Malenkov as his successor, but while Malenkov assumed the position of premier, Nikita Khrushchev gained control of the appointments process within the party and soon eclipsed Malenkov. In 1964, it was Khrushchev's turn to be ousted, although it took a while for Leonid Brezhnev to emerge the clear winner, again through party control. Now, what about Brezhnev's successor? The record shows that all previous Soviet leaders were adept at bureaucratic maneuvering and the accumulation of power, and members of the elite, but now aged, Politburo. Beyond that, there's little to go on. Almost nothing is known about the relationships between Politburo members. If history is any guide, Leonid Brezhnev's long-term successor will come to power more through adroit party politics than through any orderly selection process. It may be some time before his identity is apparent. And when it is, it may be a surprise. A name that perhaps would have surprised Brezhnev himself. Barry Sarafin, ABC News, Washington. Because of Brezhnev's age and prolonged ill health, American policy planners have had a good deal of time to consider what would happen after his death and how the United States should deal with the situation. As Carl Bernstein tells us, it was against that background that President Reagan spoke at his news conference tonight about the passing of the Soviet leader. From Moscow, we've learned of the death of President Brezhnev, a man who played a major role in world affairs for more than two decades. I want to underscore my intention to continue working to improve our relationship with the Soviet Union. Our two nations bear a tremendous responsibility for peace in a dangerous time, a responsibility that we don't take lightly. Those comments by the president were formulated long before tonight's press conference. Several months ago, the Reagan administration began making contingency plans to determine the American response to the death of Leonid Brezhnev. Those plans are embodied in a highly classified National Security Council document which defines the conduct of American policy toward the Soviets during the transition in the Kremlin. As described to me by those who worked on it, the document is based on two central assumptions. First, that the transition period will not be a time of global adventurism by the Soviets. And second, that the United States should make no dramatic moves on the world stage that might alarm the Russians during the transition, or that in any way would seek to influence the succession in the Kremlin. The basic idea is not to shake things up during this period, a high White House official told me today. The plans call for toning down our rhetoric, waiting and watching for signals. The contingency plans, called a book of ground rules for the transition by one of its authors, are extremely detailed. One section deals with what messages to send to the new leaders in the Kremlin. Another with how to coordinate the Allied response to Mr. Brezhnev's death. Another with American representation at his funeral. It was felt that it would be better for George to head that delegation, but it will be an appropriate and a very distinguished delegation. But when, it will be the vice president then who will be heading the delegation. Uh, this is what we're considering now. No final decisions have been made because they say we're waiting to hear some word about uh, the services. But the heart of the document, say those who worked on it, is a list of international issues affecting Soviet-American relations and how to deal with them during the transition. They include arms negotiations, third world questions, Poland and Afghanistan, trade, and continuing communication between the two superpowers. In each instance, say the authors, the dominant theme is caution avoiding rhetorical attack on the Soviets and stressing American willingness to improve communications with the new Kremlin leadership. The national security document is a product of a team of administration experts from the State Department, the Pentagon, the White House, and the intelligence agencies. It reflects the difficult problems inevitably raised by the death of a Soviet leader. Simply put, the United States does not know what to expect next. Thus, it has formulated a policy that marks time as effectively as possible, a policy which seeks to stabilize the diplomatic boat until those same experts can see what shape the new Soviet leadership is really going to take. This is Carl Bernstein for Nightline in Washington. When we return, we'll talk further about what lies ahead in U.S.-Soviet relations and about Brezhnev's potential successor with a panel of specialists on the Soviet Union joining us from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. The ingenious Minolta AF2M, the 35mm autofocus camera that won't let you make a mistake. 
It beams an infrared ray to focus itself, has automatic film advance and rewind, warns you when you shouldn't shoot or when you need the built-in flash. AF2M, amazing yet priced within your reach. Only from the mind of the Lord. Hitachi wants your next color television to be your best. So compare for these features. Hitachi has wood cabinets. Many other major brands do not. Hitachi has signal tracker control. It automatically monitors and corrects the color picture before you see it. And our 10 to 1 limited warranty far exceeds what many others offer. When you compare, the choice is clear. Hitachi, a world leader in technology. They told me I've got a disease that could wreck my whole life, diabetes. And there's no cure for it. They said the American Diabetes Association backs research to find a cure someday. And I said, great, but that doesn't help me now. I've got to cope with this thing now. I've got a life to live. Who's going to help me with that? And they said, the American Diabetes Association does that too. Help us give all diabetics hope for tomorrow and help for today. Government and industry are working together to make medicine packages more tamper resistant. You, the shopper, can help too. Look for signs of tampering, such as broken seals, open or damaged boxes, loose, torn or missing wrappings, discolored products, and unusual odors. If an item just doesn't look right to you, ask the pharmacist or store manager about it. In other words, use a little extra caution. Hi, I'm Bert Backrack. What the world needs now really is love, sweet love, to help millions of people out of poverty, hunger, and disease. You can help by supporting care. Your contribution to care provides the means for survival today and self-support tomorrow. Care is a personal answer to human need. Contribute to care, Box 576, New York, 10156, or your local care office. With the cooperation of the Council on Foreign Relations, we have assembled a panel of leading and, I might add, very patient specialists on the Soviet Union to explore further the question of what lies ahead in U.S.-Soviet affairs. Joining us live from the headquarters of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York is Dmitry Symes, Executive Director of the Soviet and East European Program at Johns Hopkins Foreign Policy Institute. Admiral Bobby Inman, former director of the CIA, now consultant to the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Winston Lord, a former State Department official who is now president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Leslie Gelb, national security correspondent for the New York Times. And Robert Legvold, director of the Council's Soviet project. Admiral Inman, I'd like to begin, if I may, with you and to ask you whether indeed our intelligence community is that badly off when it comes to the issue of deciding or determining who's going to be next. Do we ever have any way of, of knowing? We do very well on military items, reasonably good on economic, and not only do we do poorly on political items, but we're <clears throat> likely always to do poorly against that closed society. Why is that? Simply the enormous difficulty of trying to penetrate the Politburo itself. Is it then possible, and let me throw this question open to any one of you gentlemen, is it then possible to talk about continuity? Admiral Inman, why don't you oh, You up? have continuity from the Politburo. One of the things that Brezhnev did, even when he edged out in front, was to keep a collective leadership. Uh, it's, it may not be quite as stable as it would have been if Suslov and Karolinko were still able to play roles, but there will be continuity. Give us an insight, gentlemen, if you would, and at least three of you I know have, have served uh, in, in high roles in government. Give us an insight as to, as to what the process is now during an interim period like this in terms of regularizing or maintaining relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Well, I think, Ted, we have to project some consistency and reliability. I, I think at this point we shouldn't worry about trying to influence the succession, which I think is an impossible task. But I do think we should promote a general posture that which makes clear to the Soviet Union that we're prepared for a more constructive relationship if they show restraint around the world and they're willing to negotiate on arms control and other matters. But they will, will be firm if we have to be, if they're going to take a more confrontational posture. But make clear to the leadership 
at least in the following months, that if they wish to follow a more constructive course, we're ready to join them in that. Dimitri Simes, do you want to pick up on that? What's going on in Moscow right now, do you think? Uh, well, Ted, I think that uh, we don't know who is going to be Brezhnev's successor, partly because Politburo members don't know themselves. If they determined it in advance, the men probably would be ousted from the Politburo by Brezhnev, mm -hmm. who would perceive uh, this person as a threat. But I do think that people now are involved in a rather intense power struggle, and relationship with the United States is not on their priority list. Uh, so I think Mr. Lord is quite correct suggesting that this is not a time for major foreign policy initiatives. We should look open-minded, we should behave responsibly, we should project our reliability, but I don't think this is the time when Moscow would be willing to offer any olive branches to Washington or to accept any major arms control initiatives coming from Washington. Well, I was, about to, I was about to pose the question in a slightly different way. Is the Soviet leadership at the moment even in a position to discuss anything, since uh, you seem to be suggesting that they themselves may not quite know how this is all going to turn out? Well, uh, you, you can see my view uh, that these are people who are preoccupied with running succession, with the power struggle. I do not believe that they are well equipped at this moment uh, to handle very complex political issues. Also, let me say this. They believe that they burn their fingers in relations with the United States. And it is hard for me personally to imagine a Soviet leader who would like to be identified too much with the policy of the Tant, with any constructive initiative involving the United States. It just can be damaging to him domestically. Mr. Legvold, what do you think is going to happen to, to uh, the Tant? Is there any vestige of it left? Can indeed any new Soviet leader, and I use the term new uh, uh, in, in, I suppose, in quotation marks, can any new Soviet leader allow himself to be identified with that policy? There's no question but what a new Soviet leader would want to be identified with the policy of detente. We'll continue to emphasize that as the theme of Soviet foreign policy. But the fact is that relations between the United States and the Soviet Union are extremely harsh, are extremely deteriorated, and there's small prospect, as Dmitry Symes just said, that any new Soviet leader is in a position to take the kind of bold initiatives that would get the relationship back on a more constructive track. So where do we go from here, then? I think we have to expect an extension of the uh, status quo, the current situation. Uh, I think it is accurate to see this leadership now moving into a period of great caution, slow movement, lack of bold initiative, initiatives, an American administration that is going to be consistent in its policy, even though I think the tone with which it responds to Brezhnev's death is very constructive, nonetheless it's committed to a hardline policy toward the Soviet Union and it's not going to alter that policy because Brezhnev has passed. I think we have to expect a continuation of what we've seen for the last year or so. Eskel, do you think it's a mistake that uh, President Reagan is not going to Moscow? Well, Ted, I just don't think it's a terribly important question or interesting question uh, who the next uh, leader of the Soviet Union is going to be, whether it's going to be Andropov or a Triumvirate or whatever, because the policy is going to be the same. And it's going to be the same whether President Reagan goes there. There's a tremendous continuity. It's not like the United States when uh, the choice between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan means a real choice in the direction of policy. Their policy is essentially going to stay where it is. It's a, an encrusted society, a bureaucratic society, a frightened one, an uptight one that's made a lot of decisions that's led them to a present, de I think, fairly desperate economic situation. And they can't budge. And they're not going to, uh, uh, to uh, be in the position of making terribly bold moves on the world arena. Uh, until they get their power situation straightened out and address the economy. It's not like an election in the United States. Maybe just, we should just, distinguish. Just one, one, for, one further remark. The thing that strikes me about this is the interest in this country about Brezhnev's death. And I think it comes not from people's expectation that anything's going to change, but the sense that we in the United States and the Soviet Union are tied to the same umbilical cord of survival. That's what's important to us. I was going to say, Ted, maybe we should distinguish, though, between the next couple of months or maybe six months and what might happen over a longer period. If you look at previous phases in Soviet changes in leadership, there was a change after many months. 
and I leave that to my experts to analyze in more historical terms, but it seems to me that you have to sort out the immediate caution and possible paralysis and what this might mean over a uh, five or ten year period. I think that's a very important distinction, Ted. In the next four, five, six months, or maybe even for a large part of what remains of the Reagan administration, you're going to have this slow movement this caution against uh, disruptive political succession, this mm -hmm. absence of bold moves on the part of the leadership. But the succession is a longer-term process than the next six months. It's going to take two or three years for it to be finally sorted out. And in the course of those two or three years, the Soviet Union does face a very daunting uh, agenda of problems at home with Poland, Afghanistan, an uncertain international environment. And once the leadership begins to sort itself out, then we may begin to expect more substantial decisions on their part, and indeed it's only at that point that we may see the fruits or the consequences of whatever policy we now establish in these early stages of succession. Gentlemen, I'd like to take a break. When we come back, I hope we can examine the question of whether this is indeed a period of opportunity then for the United States. We'll continue our discussion in a moment. Mmm, something smells good. Yeah, and it tastes great. Of course. It's Maxwell House Master Blend. Mm. Isn't that supposed to save us money? Mm-hmm. It only tastes expensive. Master Blend, a special blend of 100% coffee. We make a special way so you can save money. Master Blend, it only tastes expensive. Some 60 years of know-how goes into what we make. You can use every Sunbeam electric fry pan morning, noon, and night. It's a poaching pan, a braising pan, a broiling pan, a slow cook pan, party appetizers or a whole meal pan, steaming pan, upside down cake pan, lots of ways to please your family pan. There's one for you, even if you never fry. You can turn to Sunbeam. Friday. I see you under the tube. Benson makes headlines to save an old gardener's job. <laughs> then, on the new Odd Couple, Francis moves back in on Felix. What's the matter? Your divorce ain't working out? And when you're the greatest American hero, it's hard to hold on to your girl. Papa, you asking me to marry you? Yes, I am. Then, on the quest. I knew it was coming to this. They're swinging into action when the king gets snatched on safari. Monday on That's Incredible, the woman who survived the parachute that never opened, a real-life Batman that wants to help you, and the wildest pool game ever, then... Don't be afraid. I am desire. I want tonight to last forever. And when you desire me... You can't have me! You pay for eternity. I'm a righteous man! I desire. Every weekday, ABC News This Morning with Steve Bell and Kathleen Sullivan. Politics. Conflict. Arms race. All the news this morning. Wall Street. Unemployment. Economy. All the business news this morning. Rain. Shine. Hurricanes. All the weather this morning. Baseball. Football. Racing. All the sports. ABC News This Morning. Just before Good Morning America with David Hartman and Joan London. What you need to know as you begin your day. ABC News This Morning. Uniquely qualified to bring you the world. Joining us again now, live from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, Winston Lord, the Council President, Robert Legbold, who heads the Council's Soviet Project, Dimitri Symes of Johns Hopkins University, Leslie Gelb of the New York Times, and Admiral Bobby Inman, former Deputy Director of the CIA. Admiral Inman, it strikes me that we're hearing a great deal about caution, about don't rock the boat. Is it just possible that the United States is being too timid at this time? And this is, in fact, a period of extraordinary opportunity. I don't see it as a time of extraordinary opportunity. I would not hold back on going forward with proposals. If we've got anything else in the bag for arms control, uh, a look at trying to limit the movement of weapons out into space. On the military side, I would indeed uh, support the idea of caution. This is not the time to make them more worried about their own stability. I'd also make the point, Mr. Koppel, that the final vote in who's going to succeed in power is probably going to lie with the Ministry of Defense and the KGB. And so all of those who hope to be the next number one 
are going to keep a close eye on that on those precincts. Don't expect any reductions in Soviet defense spending. Now, you may see some reaction to change to more spending on defensive systems if we lead them in that direction. But it is not a time for major new initiatives, certainly not any that use force. All right, let me play devil's advocate for a moment. If this is a time of relative uncertainty for the Soviet leadership itself, if it is a time when they might not know quite how to respond or, or how to get the, the machinery to respond uh, operating, why shouldn't we be a little more aggressive? Once again, I, well, go ahead, Admiral. I, I, I don't buy that, that it's going to be a time of such uncertainty as far as working the day-by-day -day machinery. Each of those who would like to be the leader are going to be nervous about actions impacting on their future prospects of being number one. But there is great continuity in that government. And this old group that's ruled now is likely to have its hands on the levers of power at least for the next two or three years. The time to look for, for significant change is when the next transition is made. We know far too little about the younger leaders who are going to take over, but I think then we're going to have a time of substantially greater danger. Uh, the prospect that as they look at that awesome power that they will have available to them, they may be more arrogant, less cautious about using that power than the current old Bolsheviks have been. Winston Lord, and perhaps a little less awed of, of the danger of war since they will not have experienced the Second World War and the 20 million dead with, with quite the same intensity that Brezhnev and his generation did? Well, that is another factor. I think another option they've got is to try to isolate the United States uh, by working with Western Europe and playing on the peace movement there on the one hand and probing with uh, China on the other hand and try to isolate us from our allies and our possible collaborators on the geopolitical scene. And they'll work on both. I'm, I'm sorry, who, who whispered that comment there? Uh, they'll work on both those lines. You know, Ted, I suspect that uh, the United States is playing some sort of role in whatever maneuvering is going on in the Politburo now or has been going on in the last few months. Uh, that in one, one of these leaders trying to gain a position of predominance, they, mer they very well may bring relations with the United States into that argument and say, uh, in order to gain support from the Soviet military or from the Soviet KGB, look, we need to take a harder line with the United States. Uh, the speech Brezhnev gave a couple weeks ago uh, was, in my way of thinking, a very tough line to the military, saying you're not going to get any further increases. It may be that in order to tip the scales inside, Somebody might be saying we need to take a hardline position with the United States. I think it's very important for reasons such, such as that, that the United States be very careful in this transition period not to give anyone making that argument uh, any more weight than he'll have already. The, now, is the issue is, it seems to me, Ted, what you're posing is, do we just have a general posture of we're willing to have more constructive relations or be firm depending on their behavior, or do we have to run around and come up with specific concrete proposals, say in arms control or economics, which will give them something specific to react to? I think that's where the tactical differences arise between some of the analysts. Uh, I think that there are two questions. One, what we should do, and one, what we should not do. I agree that we should not try to engage the Soviets in major new arms control initiatives. They are not prepared. But I think while there is no great opportunity, there is a great danger. Brezhnev invested a great deal of personal prestige and clout in the tent. It was easier to deal with him because we knew him better, he knew the United States better, and he was in a position to overrule the bureaucracy. I think that his successors, at least initially, are going to be much more cautious in dealing with the United States. I think it is very important for the administration to stop talking about putting the Soviet Union on a ship of history. Stop talking about prevailing in a protracted nuclear war. In short, there are few opportunities, but there are many dangers, and I hope that the administration will be skillful enough to avoid them. Dr. Legvold, uh, in the couple of minutes that we have left, begin to wrap up for us what effect, if any, you think Brezhnev's death has had, is going to have, in terms of this period of transition on U.S.-Soviet relations. I think Brezhnev's death, 
as a practical matter, has a very marginal effect on the character of U.S.-Soviet relations. Indeed, I think the process of political succession is going to be of secondary importance. The shape of U.S.-Soviet relations is going to be determined by the interaction between the two countries. It's going to be shaped by the character of U.S. foreign policy, by the, the way in which that policy works its influence in international relations and creates an environment to which the Soviet Union responds one way or another. And in this spirit, uh, it seems to me that the initial reaction of the administration has been a very constructive and an intelligent one, as I understand the Bernstein report earlier in the program. I think the idea at this point of restraining uh, ourselves from disturbing moves or moves that would disturb the Soviet Union is important. I think toning down the rhetoric in the present moment is important. I think giving them the option of an improved relationship in the future is extremely important. The basic course of the administration, however, is a hardline policy, and one can agree or disagree with this policy over the longer run, but that's what's going to decide the character of the relationship, not Brezhnev's passing or the particular character of the succession in the next several months. Winston Lord, only a few seconds left. Is there an infrastructure in place in the Soviet Union with which we can continue to deal on a daily basis? Uh, yes, I think there is. Uh, and, and in terms of day-to-day -day issues, I think for bold new uh, breakthroughs, I don't think we're going to see that for the next several months. All right, gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us, and uh, most especially for being so patient and staying with us until this late hour. I'll be back in a moment. It looks on me, Stouffer's Lean Cuisine. Less than 300 calories, Stouffer's Lean Cuisine. I love the taste, I love what I see. I love being all that I can be. Ooh, I love the way it looks on me, and so does he. Stouffer's Lean Cuisine. You will love the way it looks on you. I love the way it looks on me. From Radio Shack's world of the TRS-80 comes the microcomputer business system. Meet the business partner who works as hard as you do. The TRS-80 microcomputer business system. It handles the accounting, payroll, inventory, even word processing. The TRS-80 is expandable and requires no formal training. Now that's a partner. TRS-80 business systems from 1849. Only from Radio Shack and Radio Shack Computer Centers. The computer experts. Has Dinah Shore finally found Mr. Wonderful inquiring minds want to know? I want to know. What can you do to protect you and your family from Tylenol copycat tamperings? This week's National Enquirer tells you what exclusive details does Glenn Campbell reveal about his latest marriage? Can you win the war on fat with a new army diet? It's in the Enquirer. Is the spirit of John Lennon talking to Yoko from beyond the grave? Find out in the Enquirer over 100 features for people with inquiring minds. Like me. NCAA football and ABC Sports, 20 great years, and here's another reason why. Determination, the drive of highly ranked Penn State. Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions, led by quarterback Tom Blackledge and top rusher Kurt Warner, are aiming for the top. But Jerry Faust and his fighting Irish are determined to stop them. Can Notre Dame's gold rush defense, one of the best in the nation, tame the Lions' awesome attack? Don't pass up this key showdown, plus other games. A great reason to watch NCAA college football Saturday on ABC. Sunday, on Ripley's Believe It or Not, a Marilyn Monroe fantasy robot, and the city that fought a volcano and won. Then, at 8, 7 Central and Mountain, it's the man of steel in action. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, Margot Kidder, and Christopher Reeve as Superman. There'll be continuing coverage of the aftermath of Leonid Brezhnev's death on ABC News broadcasts tomorrow, beginning with ABC News This Morning and Good Morning America, and on ABC's World News Tonight. Also, The Last Word with Greg Jackson and Phil Donahue will be back at its usual time tomorrow night. That's our report on Nightline for tonight. This is Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been ABC News Nightline. If you would like to obtain a transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $2 to Nightline, Box 234 Ansonia Station, New York, New York, 
10023. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. Tomorrow on Good Morning America reports from Russia on who will succeed Leonid Brezhnev.